You and your brother apparently don't get along. We never have. I can't stand him anymore. You know, okay. uh, so he's been this way my whole life. Okay, but you you did take two thousand dollars from him, right? I didn't take it. These are the plaintiffs, Tonya and Milton Mick Knudsen. Milton says the defendant is his sister, and they're having a bitter misunderstanding about the $2,000 she owes them. That's why they're suing. This is the defendant, Barbara Kwan. She says the plaintiff acted like a big shot on a family home he was trying to buy her out of. Now that he's lost his job and isn't such a big shot anymore, he's trying to sue her for something she just doesn't owe. She's accused of bothering a brother. All parties, please use your right hand. What you are about to witness is real. The participants are not actors. They are actual litigants with a case pending in civil court. Both parties have agreed to drop their claims and have their cases settled here before Judge Marilyn Millian in our forum, the People's Court. People's Court is now in session. The Honorable Judge Marilyn Millian is now presiding. Litigants have been sworn, Your Honor. Thank you, Douglas. You're welcome. Okay, Mr. and Mrs. Knudson, talk to me. What are we, uh, this is a family home that was left to how many people? Um, I believe there was... 17. 17 people um, that had an investment in this house. It was a Knudson built home that my granddad okay. built. Okay, um, and so for all those years that 17 people were left the property, it would be rented and then you would proportionally distribute the rent proceeds? No, because that was just found out lately that it was 17 owners. My dad passed six years ago, and we had no part of it at that time. I'm lost. So then when did you ever get rent? We never did. Um, what happened was uh, his uncle and his wife called us and was talking to us about this house, saying that um, they didn't want to... Um, run it out anymore and take care of the property. They just wanted to buy it out. Who was taking the rental property? Who was renting, who was getting the rental income? My uncle. His uncle, Everett Knudsen. Right, but I'm looking at your complaint and right in your complaint, you say that you wanted to buy your sister's share because you wanted a bigger stake and uh, you figure even if you don't get the house in the end, at least you'll be getting more proportion of rent. What are what were you referring to when you said that in the complaint? If we didn't get that, if we didn't get the house, I don't know. The, the thing is, Are you going to stop talking for him and uh, let him talk? Okay, good. Yeah. So here's my question to okay, you. Right um, in the complaint, here's what you say. Just a second. Here's what you say. In the complaint, you say, we approached my sister to buy her share of the house. We did the same with my stepmom and my niece. I gave my sister $2,000 for her share. And I, if my wife and I got the house, great. If we weren't the ones who wound up purchasing house, then we'd get the defendant's share of the proceeds, oh, I'm sorry, of the sale. So no, who yes. was renting out a house that you had a, an interest in and not giving you any rent money? That was your uncle? Yes. Yeah. Was your uncle allowed under the terms of, um, of the bequest, was he allowed to live in it or rent it or do whatever he wanted during his lifetime? <sighs> Evidently, yes, because we just found out that we were co-owners in it just within the past couple of years. Wow. So you approach your sister and you bought her share for how much? $2,000. And is that correct, Ms. Kwam, that you sold him the, your share for $2,000? No, I, uh, I, he, want, he wanted to buy my share so he had as much credits as my uncle did when it went off in auctioning. And he still owed me $500 because he was going to buy me for $2,500. And he never paid okay, me the $500. do you have any proof? Do you have any proof that he was supposed to buy you out for 2500 It's just his word. Okay, you have a text, an email, anything? Well, my daughter was there, and Mrs. Knutson wasn't there at the bank when this was, uh, he gave me the money and stuff, so I kind of have a problem with her testifying against me because she wasn't there. Oh, I don't know what she wants to testify about. Maybe she's testifying about other stuff about you. But is your daughter here <laughs> prepared to testify? No, she's renting a house for my brother, and she was kind of, uh, I don't know. He can be malicious, if you want to say that. I rented from him before, and he's kind of a scary person. Okay, so, uh, so you and, and your brother apparently don't get along? We never have. 
I can't stand him anymore. You know, okay. uh, so he's been this way my whole life. Okay, but you you did take two thousand dollars from him, right? I didn't take it. He gave it to me, and he says that if he lost, he gave it to his you. Loss. Yes. Right. So he gives it to you. And is there any paperwork from the purchase of her share of the house? Yeah. The lawyer sent out, um, and you should have that showing what everybody got. That is not my question. I'm not talking about what happened after this house got sold. I'm talking about when you bought your sister's shares for $2,000, did you create any paperwork about the selling of the shares? No, we didn't because we didn't know we had to. Um, so no, it was no real estate point. transaction can be verbal. You can't have a verbal real estate transaction. Transactions involving real estate have to be in writing. So now what do we have? Typically speaking, I turn around and look at him and say, oh, let's not, let's, uh, this is the piece de resistance. The house gets sold. And even though you sold your rights to the house to him, you end up getting a share called $758.59, and you go and cash the check instead of giving it to your brother to whom you knew you had, quote, sold the shares to. So tell me about that, how you cashed that $758 check. My brother has not talked to me, and when he found out I was getting a $750 check, he finally calls me up and says, Hey, sis, how are you doing? I love you. And, uh... My mom passed away 28 years ago, and he still owed me $500 from the 2500 He promised me he would pay. So that's one reason why I did not give him the $750. The second is my mom's been... Well, that would only... I'm sorry. Years. I'm sorry. That would only justify you keeping 500 Yeah. That wouldn't justify yes, you yeah. keeping 758 So, okay, go on. Okay, well, so then, uh, you know... My mom passed away, and I was supposed to get her cedar chest. Well, he's kept that hostage, if you want to say, and he has everything of my mom's and my dad's, and both of them are dead. And here it is six years later from my dad in 28, and he says, I don't get it. What, what gives him the right to say, I don't get what my mom wanted to give me? Look, there's a That's forum for reason. this. When, <laughs> right, but when siblings are arguing over an estate, the forum to take care of that is to go to probate court. And to, and to stake your claim and your right to whatever it is that you feel. Now, most times, if there's not enough involved to justify it, people just don't bother. But, you know, there's a way for you to handle that in court. Um, there's also a way for you to buy a, a share of someone's real estate interest. And it's not verbal. That's not a way to do that. So it's not a valid contract. But so here you've got $758.59 that you pocketed, which was apparently your share. But you also pocketed 2000 a couple of years ago and when he bought your share. But if he doesn't have your share, then why should you keep the $2,000? I mean, I was looking at this saying, oh, well, you got to pay him the 758 because that really belongs to him. But it doesn't belong to him because it, this contract wasn't in writing. So now you owe him, to, ironically, more than that, which is the 2000 that he paid no, you originally. No, I don't because I, didn't, I did not agree to pay him the 2000 He said if he loses, then it's his loss, Your Honor. We all we right, all but that's that no, no. Yes, I know that. That's if he doesn't get to buy the house. Mm. But you don't get to have your cake and eat it too. And what you did was, you. The only reason for you to have two thousand dollars is what you were selling him your share, right? I guess so. I was kind of, you know, it just happened just like right. that. Right. And sorry. then, and then oh. you turn around and then you take the money for your share. So you see, you know what you're doing. It's yes, not like a big mystery. Well, right. Okay. So you kids. can't have it both Life ways. Everybody. Well, he okay. Can't have it both but ways you got to return the two. Well, no, you only get to have it one way. And that's you get to keep the 758.59. But guess what you got to return? You've got to return the 2000. What ended up happening? You didn't get the house. Your uncle ended up being high bid. Yes. I didn't even go to the auction, you your know, honor. Did you know about the auction? Why weren't you at the auction if you wanted the house so badly? All I had at uh, for auction was. What I had in savings so you couldn't afford it. That's fine. Right. Okay. So that's why you didn't go. You didn't. You didn't have the funds to buy it at that moment. So that was exactly. it. All right. And he. Um, and okay. He, he was at work, and I was there. She was. There. And no, just in case we couldn't get on it. Just to be about. What are you going to buy it with? You need money to buy it. These are some basic things. Well, we things, did have guys. some like, money. Yeah. But I was there just to see what his uncle was going to bid on. Bid. You know. And so his bid uncle it bought it for how and, much? What did his uncle buy it for? Thirty-two thousand dollars. And do you feel that that's undervalued? Yes. Yes. Uh, that house yeah. is worth $200 and some thousand dollars. He rented it out, and the people that 
But guys, you, you see, you, how did it end up in auction to begin with? That's what I don't understand. Because we couldn't all agree uh, what to be done with it. So he took right, it. Right, so, but then why so, didn't it just get sold? Why did it have to be sold at auction? Because how did the government get involved? Was there like a big tax lien or something? Was there? No. no. I paid the taxes on it. His you know, lawyer I mean, somehow it, just, got it sounds like auction. nobody was really uh, on top we of weren't. this because we weren't. All right, Ms. Kwam, I'm ordering you to return the two thousand um, dollars. You know, you guys, if 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 there is any foul why. play with the uncle, well, I'm going to tell you why, because My he didn't get anything for that. Order against him. I don't I care. Know, but I, that's I don't care. I what does that have to do with you? Seven hundred and fifty because it does because I only got seven hundred and fifty, Your Honor. Because the house sold for only 32. Right, but the house shouldn't have sold brother. for only 32. So you guys, no, did, if there's something wrong, didn't... if there was some hinky stuff because because he, you know, your uncle put it at bid, at auction and then he's the bid, you know, if there's some hinky stuff there, then you guys need to have that looked at by a lawyer. But that means somebody has to get the funds, hire a lawyer. You know, it depends on how far you want it to go. You know, people don't just get to do whatever they want, but sometimes it costs us to be able to put air bad behavior in the courts. You have to go to court. You have to you have to file something. You know, you got to do something. But I don't know, yeah, Ms. Palm, how you don't see I how will. you owe two thousand dollars. You took two thousand dollars for having a sh to, for because giving him your shares, and then you didn't give it. I don't care. And then you didn't give him your he shares. Really so that's why it could not be it could not be any clearer why you have to give him back the two thousand dollars. You have to give him back okay, the two thousand dollars because you didn't do then. what you said you were gonna do. Two thousand dollars verdict for the plaintiff. Me. That's my judgment. Thank you. Not doing it. Not doing it. So the defendant has to give the $2,000 back. She's there saying, you're not going to do it. Uh, Ms. Kwam, you have to. You're, you're getting a court order now to give that $2,000 back. What are you going to do? I don't have a brother anymore. I'll give him that, but he can stay out of my life. All right. Well, look, you got to give $2,000 whether you like it or not. You're going to have to do it. Ms., uh, Mr. and Ms. Knudsen, what do you think about the judge's de decision now? I know that, that we didn't do things right. And yeah. if she would have gave us that money, it would have been fine. We, we wouldn't be it, here. We, we had it set up that we were going to meet and go through through the stuff in the shed. And she never it. showed up. Yeah. All right. Very good. Okay. Yeah. Well, look, I hope you work it out. All right. That's the way it ends in right. court here today. Now you get $2,000 back from her. When I see brothers and sisters and siblings fighting like this over what remains of an estate, whether it's real property or anything else, I think to myself, God, I wish I left nothing and the last check I write bounces, you know? Yeah, yeah, Whew. exactly. You know, but um, it's probably the best thing you could ever do for your uh, heirs is to not not put them in this position. Right. Have 17 people own a house. We're having ironclad. Just ha just sell it, and then the proceeds go to the 17 right. people. Right. But, you know, when you've got, when you put people in that position, that they have to be in business together, or they have to own a house together, or they have, you know, what you've done is exactly the opposite of what you intended to do. Right. You intended to make everybody there happy, and what you did was you made everybody unhappy. Yeah. And it's kind of sad. Okay, Layla wants to know this. Hey, Harvey. Can my boss force me to get a COVID vaccine in order to go to work? So you gotta know this. I mean, this is just untested territory. Based on what I know so far, I think a, an employer has a legal right to keep somebody out who doesn't get a test. Um, I think there's a public safety issue there. And also there's not a protected class of people that doesn't have to get a vaccine. So I think the answer is yes, they can. That'll do it for this case. Litigants for the next case inside the courtroom. This is the plaintiff, Josie John Friedel. She says she rented an apartment from the defendant, but had to move out because others in the house like to party all night. She's suing the defendant for $800 for the return of her security, which he refuses to give her. This is the defendant, Gary Amara. He says the plaintiff's two roommates are still living in the house, and he's not returning security while tenants are still residing there. The plaintiff should go after them, not him. He's accused of not returning money. All parties, please get your right hands. 
Welcome back to the People's Court. Next case on the docket, the plaintiff says she had to move out of the room she rented because her housemates uh, were partying all night. She couldn't handle it, so she had to bail. Now, the defendant says that he's not giving the plaintiff back anything because her two roommates are still living there. It's the case of Hardy Hardy. Thank you, Douglas. You're welcome. Okay, Ms. Gianfrido, what's going on here? Trying, trying to get my security, Your Honor. Um... I rented the apartment with Mr. Amara uh, December 12th of 17. I gave him a month and a half, two months notice that I was leaving. He keeps telling me, you ask them back for the security. Why? I gave you security in first month's rent. Okay, here, were you under a lease when you left? No, we did not have a lease. We only had a lease you were a for one year. Month to month. Okay, and then after that, it became a month to month. So you yes. give him notice and you leave and you tell him, I, I'd like my security back. I have nothing to do with the apartment anymore. And he says, go get it from the people living there. Why was that your response, Mr. Amara? Well, I mean, my policy is that I, I take a security deposit when somebody rents the apartment. And, and when, uh, when the, the security deposit was given to me, I don't know what arrangements were made with Josie and her roommates as to whether they reimbursed her at that time or not. But the fact that she decided to leave, uh, even giving me notice, um, the fact still remains that there's still people living in the apartment, number one. And number two, uh, e even if uh, they had left, I would have had to, to review the apartment and make sure everything was right and everything was uh, up to standard. Yeah, so, but I guess that's the point. Why didn't you just do that? Why didn't you go well, in, because, take a look, figure it out, get another deposit from the tenants? Because there's no lease, right? Is she wrong or did she leave in the middle of a lease? Well, in the state of Connecticut, uh, uh, a lease, when it when, when it runs out, it, it automatically turns to a month-to-month -month lease. So it's still in effect. Right. The lease is still in effect. Well, no, there's a month, and right, I, but there's a month-to-month -month lease. Just a second. There's a month-to-month -month and she canceled it. She canceled your arrangement with her by giving you notice and saying, I'm out. Now, the next 30 days happen, and there's a group of people who may be her old friends, you know, who she, you know, whatever, but you have a choice to say, hey, get out, I don't, I don't have a month to month with you, or to say, hey, you guys are on a month to month. It's a new lease every 30 days, essentially. Anybody could break it with 30 days notice. I mean, uh, so I don't know, what's the deal? You never have to give her back her What if those people have other roommates and then some of them leave and some of them come, she'd have to wait 20 years to get her deposit back? that you know if, she if, gave her? You, because she gave you the entire deposit. People didn't give it to you in snippets. If she owes somebody money, that's a lawsuit against her, not you. She gave you the deposit. She wants the deposit back. Every 30 days, when you accept those people living there, you're basically, you know, you know that they're paying you rent, you're accepting their rent, and those are your new tenants. Well, the thing is that the, the apartment is secured with a security deposit. And, yes, uh, I know. And, and once once everyone vacates the, the apartment, I'd be happy to give her her uh, no, security see, back. No, see, you're acting, I would be 100% in agreement with you if she left in the middle of a lease. And then she turns around and says, hey, I know there's three months left on the lease, but I'm out and I want the security deposit back. And you would look well, at her I, and say, are you out of your mind? You don't get the security deposit back because there's three months left on your lease. At the end of the lease, I'll look at, at it and see whether you're entitled to the money. What you're not getting is the end of the lease is 30 days because it's a month to month. Okay, I, I, I can accept that, Your Honor. But um, the, uh, the security deposit uh, is, uh, I don't know who gave me the security deposit. I mean, she physically handed yeah. it to me, but I don't know if they each paid wow. a third of the deposit or not. That's none no. of your I mean, business. If she handed right. it to you, then return it to her because she handed it to you. What does the lease? Where do I wait, stand wait. with? What does the wait, 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 wait? What does the original lease say about who was giving you a security deposit? I have to read the lease. I don't have it in front of me. I think you. Well, have let's it read it. Hey, who was she? The only tenant at the no. beginning? Were you the only tenant? 
Yes, December 12th, I moved in there by myself. The one that says 12, 17, 17 is the one when I moved in by okay. myself. The one with Mark and Jose, that's when the roommates came as of April 1st of ninth. I think it was 18, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so in December, there's only one tenant. Yes. Tenant prior to occupancy shall deposit with the landlord the sum of 800 as security. There's no question that she deposited the 800, right? When she got the lease in December of 18. That, that's correct. You then, when she had room, right. So when she, when roommates moved in, did you get an additional 800? No. Clearly, if the, for, if the 800 you got only came from her and you had never met these other people and you didn't collect an additional money from these other people, what's the problem? There was actually th three leases prior to this one that Josie uh, that I wrote up for Josie. The first one, she came in by herself saying she was going to just rent the, the unit herself. Then she came to me and said that she was having a when problem. When she stopped, she wanted and that first one, she gave you 800 bucks, right? That's correct. Josie was that's alone, correct. and Josie's the only person. There wasn't a frog in her pocket. There weren't that's, other that's roommates. Correct. Just Josie gave you 800 bucks. Okay, go on. Right, that's correct. So then she, she came to me with an, another person that she vouched for, that she said she wanted to be on the lease. And when I when I do up a lease, I want all occupants to be on the lease. So I wrote up a new lease. And I it was a, with her and a friend of hers. And then she ran into problems with that uh, roommate. And so we ran, we made up a, a third lease with uh, uh, these other roommates. Oh, that's very nice. How does that affect anything that we're trying to decide here today? We're trying to decide well, he, if security, she is in, just a second, security. if she is in the middle, yeah. the security is for your lease and you have a month to month. Your lease expires essentially every 30 days. So if she tells you I'm out, my 30 days are over, I have a right to leave and I want my security, you are acting like she's in the middle of a one year lease. You're behaving legally as though she was still in the middle of a one year lease. You're looking at her and saying, this is precipitous. It's not precipitous. You have people there who you're accepting money from. If you don't want them, give them 30 days notice and tell them to get out or get the deposit from them. That's your plan. Your, your next move is to tell them, you guys got to give me your deposit or you guys got to get out and get somebody who does pay a deposit. But these are you problems. They are not Ms. Gianfrido problems. My ruling in this case is in favor of Ms. Gianfrido and the amount of the $800. That's my verdict. Thank you, Your Honor. So the defendant loses in this case. It'll be interesting to see what he's thinking right now, Mr. Amar. What do you think? Well, the, the problem that I have is that I have two people still living in the apartment, of which the security was put in place for them as well as for Josie. The fact that she left, I just feel that the apartment isn't secure. And if it's up to me, my responsibility to get the additional, uh, this other uh, security, from them, then, uh, or I'm going to have to have them ev evicted because they don't have the money. Well, that's up to you. That's up to you. All right. Sorry about that, Mr. Amara. You just learned a lesson, I think, here the hard way. Mr. J Ms. John Frido, Josie, what are you thinking right now? Yes. How do you feel about the decision? I'm loving it. Um, I love it. Uh, you know, I finally get my security back. It's his problem. You know, that's his apartment. I gave him my 1600 when I moved in there. I want my $800 back. Well, you're going to get it. Congratulations. <laughs> Happy day. Thank you. Okay? You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Let's see what the judges have to say. I got the impression listening to the evidence in this case that the landlord's not like maliciously withholding the money. He was he's misinformed. He's got this idea that this $800 that the plaintiff Josie uh, put up as a security is somehow now in, in perpetuity a security deposit that's going to travel with them. Because she it. knows those roommates and right. picked them. But, right. But it's really when's the end of the lease. Exactly. And it's a month I think to you month. cut right to the heart of the matter when you said, look, uh, suppose those two roommates stay there for the next 40 years. <laughs> Does that mean she never gets her money back? Right. Yeah, they, yeah, she never gets her money back. It's, it's absurd. Right. And there's no lease. 
There was a lease a long time ago. As soon as that lease ends, it's a 30-day, month-to-month tenancy. It's like a new contract every first of the month, right? Right, exactly. And the landlord can protect himself right now. I think he's, he's a little shin. worried. His That's right. But it's right his ch- it's, it's his like, head on the chopping block, right. not not he Ms. Wants to fade that heat onto to her. Josie. Right. Oh, if they pay me, that. I'll pay her. No. Uh, go get uh, your uh, money uh, or evict them right. and get people who will put a security. He's got to go on. talk to them, get on the phone, go they see them. They owe him some money already. I got to have some security. They probably do. I got to have some security. You think that's the real case? I know that's the real thing. Ah, he might be upside down already. He's upside down already, and he's worried about and he's mad because she's the one who picked them. They were right. her roommates. But, I you know, then then the, the alternative is just say, give them their 30 days and right. move it along. Right. Well, you know? you know, evictions are complicated things during the COVID crisis. Yeah. So the rules have changed a little bit. Okay, Jerry wants to know this. Hey, Harvey, uh, please help me. I sued my contractor who I paid in cash and won a judgment against him, and he won't pay up. He's self-employed. I have no paper trail to his bank or anything. How can I get my money? Well, there is something called an examination of judgment debtor. And that means after you win a judgment, after a period of time, you can call them back into court and under oath. You can ask them a million questions. Where are your bank accounts? What are your bank account numbers? Where do you keep your money? Um, what about other assets? What about your employment? Where do you where do you work? You can get you can get salaries attached. All sorts of things you can do. Again, examination of judgment debtor. That will do it for this case. Litigants for the next case inside the courtroom. This is the plaintiff, Loretta Washington. She says she purchased a Range Rover from the unscrupulous defendant who sold her the car with major problems he knew about at the time of sale. This guy is a sneak, and she wants her money back. So she's suing him for the $3,500 she's owed. This is the defendant, Samuel Brown. He says the plaintiff got a great deal on his Range Rover, and when she took it to the dealership, they tried to get her to spend $5,000 on the suspension. Dealers always try to rip you off. He sold her a great car and owes her nothing. He's accused of selling a bad Rover. All parties, please use your right hands. Welcome back to the People's Court. Next case on the docket, the plaintiff says she purchased the Range Rover from the defendant and is really pissed off because it was a lemon. But the defendant says he gave the plaintiff a great deal on the car and just because the dealer says it needs five grand worth of work, it doesn't make it true. It's the case of rollover, Your Honor. Thank you, Douglas. You're welcome. Okay, Ms. Washington, you are suing Mr. Brown, the person you bought a car from. For $3,500, because according to you, you had to resell the car at a loss thanks to things that he hid from you. Tell me what happened here. Yes, Your Honor, that's correct. I met with Mr. Brown on the 10th after seeing a vehicle that he'd put up for sale. And I, he and I arranged to meet on the 10th of August so that I could get a closer look at the vehicle and also do a test drive, which I did. So uh, you see the Range Rover. So you settle upon a price with him of how much? $16,500? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, and what discussions do you have besides negotiating the price? What discussions do you have about the car? I, when he and I were doing the test drive, I asked, I said, is there anything wrong with the vehicle? He said, no. I said, why are you wanting to sell the vehicle? He said, because I have five vehicles and this particular vehicle isn't being used. So it's, you know, he didn't have any use for it. And he told me that he had recently got the Range Rover serviced, which you only have to do once a year. And it's $300 yearly. And that was the only thing he told me about the vehicle. And, you know, on the um, information when he put it for sale, um, you know, it was saying it was in good condition. Uh, never was it mentioned that um, of the damage that the Range Rover dealership had put on the documents that I picked up. Okay, so let's slow down a second. You buy the car, and were you? Uh, was there a problem with the car after you bought it that caused you to go to the dealership, or did you just go to the dealership to see if everything was okay? Yes. Yeah, so I started noticing like a gasoline smell when I would get out of the vehicle, when I backed it up into my garage, I could smell gasoline fuel. 
Um, and also sometimes going to get in the car, I would smell the fuel. And then it was also burning gas like you wouldn't believe. I would only go a mile and it already burned four gallons of gas. So it prompted me to just see what was going on with the vehicle. And when you brought it in, what happened? When I took it to, um, I basically took it to the where he got in the car service because they had the documents there. Um, they were reluctant, reluctant to actually share those with me, so they actually called him while I was there, and he gave the okay that it was okay for them to give me the documents. And so when I looked at those documents, I could not believe that there were seven things that he declined on the third of August, which was seven days. So the third is when he went to get the car serviced. And then the 10th is when I met him to look at the vehicle. But there were seven things, five of which were on a failed status. Okay. Let me talk to you, Mr. Brown. Uh, apparently, she took it to the same dealership that you had taken it to for service. They remembered the car and said, well, we, we've already said what's wrong with this car. And um, they call you, you release the documents, and the documents have all kinds of stuff that they're saying needs doing. So she feels that you misled her because you actually knew of stuff that you weren't disclosing. What's your response to that? Well, Your Honor, I never told her about the recommendations, and they are recommendations. Anyone that ever bought uh, uh, um, luxury vehicles know this is how the dealership makes their money. This vehicle never Can has any fuel leak, so I, so I have no idea what she's even talking about. Well, one the of the things, I do have the document in front of me, okay, and it is, I can understand her suspicions when you took the car in to get serviced on August 3rd, and got rid of it on August 10th without showing her this document. They tell you yes. all these things, and you tell her none of them. So explain to me why that's okay. Because those are recommendations. There's, there were nothing, there's nothing wrong with the vehicle. I own the vehicle. Well, uh, for, I understand uh, that. There, there are some items that are called caution, like overall tire condition, tires are worn, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But then there are items that say flat out fail, like you need to replace the front pads and rotor sensors. I know, I know that when you take a car to a dealership, they have a really low threshold for when you need to replace them because that's how they make their money at the service department. I get that. But I'm very concerned about the last two, like replace fuel pump top cap filter seal because fuel pump top cap is leaking gas. That's pretty direct. That's not a recommendation. And this, the, uh, the last one where it talks about the engine knocking noise that they're hearing, ah, that might be, you know, she drove the car. I don't know if she heard any noise. She didn't hear any noise. Okay. But this l gas leaking thing is important to me because the first thing that happens to her is that she's smelling the gas, and that's why she takes it into them. Your Honor, I had that car parked in my garage for two years. And not one time have I ever crunked that vehicle up and smelled gas. Even the day that I brought it out to her and parked it on base, there was no gas smell at all. What discussions did you have with her out. when you sold it to her? Specifically, did she ask you, is there anything wrong with the car? Yeah, she did ask me if anything was wrong with it. I told her that I, had, I never had any problems out of it. And that's the God on the truth. I never had any issues out of this car. And those were recommendations by the dealership. Well, I, never I, had, I, I hear you, I, but I know, but you see that this says fail, right? You know, it's different than recommendations. The word caution is on the bottom. That sounds like it's a recommendation, but the word fail mm -hmm. is on the top. What I, I'm just a little bit concerned that you have a leaking gas. That one's like so black and white. I'm kind of curious why you didn't hey, bring that up. Or if you sat around and when they called you and they said, can we show it to her? When you said, yeah, sure, show it to her. Why, if, if that was your attitude, why didn't you just show her that from the beginning? Because those were, were recommendations, Your Honor. Had, had I smelled ga a gas leak, I would even drove the vehicle up there. Ms. Washington, um, why did you, and, and apparently, what'd you do with the vehicle? I sold it. To where, Car CarMax? For yes, um, yeah. significantly less than you paid for it. Um, you know, it, you took a big hit, and you want him to, to take that hit. Uh, when, when there's a sale of a used car, that sale is an as-is sale. 
The only exception to that is if somebody warrants something to be true and then it isn't. So if I tell you I just changed the uh, transmission and then you take the car to, and, and, and I say that to induce you to buy it, and then you take the car to your mechanic who says, this is not a new transmission. This transmission was put in on such and such a time and this transmission has a problem and this transmission, that's an actual lie. So I have to look at the, that's why I always ask what is the exact conversation between the parties. In this case, I don't really have that much of a dispute about what the exact conversation is. You both kind of admit that she asked, Mr. Uh, Ms. Washington asked Mr. Brown, is there anything wrong with the car? And Mr. Brown said, no. To that, Ms. Washington adds, well, you sold it like, you know, right after you heard about the problems. And that seems dishonest. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. People have reasons why they sell cars. The actionable claim where you can come into court and say, wait a second, you lied, is if the guy misrepresents something. When you ask him what's wrong with the car, does that mean that these six things are wrong with the car and he lied? I don't feel that way because we all know that dealerships have a very low threshold for when to replace worn stuff. But there is one item I do feel that way on, and that's a leaking gas tank. And when you say there's nothing wrong with the car, but you know there's a leaking gas tank, that's the one item that worries me. So I am going to award the plaintiff that item, which is $930.22. Um, that's my verdict. Good luck, folks. So in this dispute over a used car, uh, the plaintiff is going to get back a little over $900, not the $3,500 she was asking for from the defendant. Mr. Brown, the defendant, uh, what do you think, Mr. Brown? You've got to give her back, you know, more than $900. How do you feel about it? Well, I mean, the decision is what the decision is, but if this vehicle was leaking gas, she would have smelt it the day that she test drove it. And I, I can't believe she sat here and said that this vehicle burnt Four gallons of gas within a mile. That is a blatant lie. Okay, sorry about that, but that's the judge's verdict. Let's see what Ms. Washington has to say about it. Ms. Washington, what are you thinking right now? Well, I'm thinking that, of course, I, w I would have um, been more satisfied with all of my money back. However, uh, honestly, the day that I sold that car, even though I took a loss, I felt like down the road it was going to be even a greater loss, more money being dumped into it, and I just didn't want to deal with that. All righty. Well, you didn't get what you were seeking, but anyway, you don't have the car anyway, so you're going to get more than $900 back. Uh, congratulations. That's the judge's decision. Okay. Well, let's see what the judges have to say about this. Let's join them now for another session of After the Verdict. The plaintiff in this case ends up with half a loaf, which is better than nothing, I guess. She was looking for around, was it two or $3,000, the difference between what she sold it for and what she had just paid for it a week earlier, 10 days earlier, not very long. She turned around quickly and got rid of it. She did. She did. Yeah. I guess it was really gnawing at her. But... I, I think that was probably a mistake on her part. I do. To go and run over to AutoZone or uh, one of the companies that buys cars wholesale and then resells them because they're not going to She was going to take a big hit by right, doing You're that. not going to get top dollar there. She just paid for the car. And really, but you know what? Pre-purchase inspection. Oh, that's the Especially answer. in a luxury car like oh this. Oh, my God. You it's not like she's buying a $1,000 hoopty and she doesn't no, want to spend $100. It could be a ticking time bomb. Right. So, she's you know. spending $16,000. Right. You know, one would think that she'd just take it to the dealership and right. have them look at it for a hundred and something dollars. And they say, oh, yeah, we know exactly what's wrong with it. We don't even have to look at it. I bought yeah. a ton of used cars, and I've also shelled out money for pre-purchase inspections, $100, $150, whatever it was, and then walked away. Yeah. The guy came back to me and said, you know, it's a nice looking car, but, and they start listing right. the problems. I'm like, yeah, I don't want to get into that. And I just say, you can't you know, just fall in love with the outside no, of a car. No, you got to be careful. Okay, uh, Doug wants to know this. Hey, Harvey, uh, tow truck companies are agents of property owners. So why do towed litigants, I love that, towed litigants, uh, sue the tow truck company and not the property owners? Here's the thing. You can sue the property owner if the property owner crossed the legal line. If a property owner calls a tow truck company without legal authority and says, tow this car when it shouldn't be towed, you can absolutely sue 
the uh, person who called as well as the tow truck company. The tow truck company has an obligation to independently determine if the tow is legal or not. But if it's not legal and it was apparent to the owner and they did it say out of revenge, or even if they were just misguided, and your car gets towed as a result, and you have damage as a result, you can sue both the tow truck company and the person who called. See you next time.